Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this webinar on how to ace number properties. This is a fairly interesting webinar. In this webinar, we start from the very basic concepts of number properties, develop a method, and then help you answer uh, 500 level, 600 level, and then the most challenging questions in number properties. So, so essentially, all you need to know is a few formulas in this webinar. And if you have a fairly good idea of, uh, of those formulas, we can help you use those formulas uh, and, and, and apply them to the most challenging questions. And to make sure that you, you have a basic level of familiarity with number properties, we did send two video lessons your way, which were on primes. Now, the focus of this webinar is going to be on LCM and GC. That's where you're going to see most of the questions over there. But you're going to see, uh, uh, you know, an incredible application of the concept of primes over there. If you've not gone through these video lessons, uh, I would recommend that you go through them. They are a part of your free trial. You can go through them uh, by just logging into your EGMAT account. If you're a paid student, of course, you can go to the number of properties course and access these concepts as well. With that, we also have some upcoming uh, free webinars. We have one next Saturday on how to ace GMAT RC. This webinar is designed for people who are not, and I, I repeat, who are not voracious readers. So if you're not someone who likes to read, but still wants to get to that 90th percentile on, on reading comprehension, this webinar is for you. In this webinar, Pyle talks about a few key reading strategies, which if you uh, use while, while reading a GMAT reading comprehension passage, you're gonna find that you do two things. You actually improve your comprehension and you do end up saving time because you don't reread the passage. This webinar is next Saturday at uh, on August 24th at 7 a.m. Pacific. With that, uh, this is a fairly well attended webinar, and to to make sure that uh, uh, that we we understand this group as a whole, we ask a couple of leading questions. The first one is when do you plan to take the test? The second one is what is your target GMAT score? Let's get those responses in here. Okay, with regards to the, the composition of this group, when people want to take the test, uh, so, so about 19% of you want to take the test right away, which is within the next 15 days. Uh, then we have two large groups, those who have upwards of 45 days and those who haven't taken a data as of yet. That's about 57% uh, of, uh, of, of this class over here. Now, with regards to uh, the target GMAT scores, what I really see is about 55, 56% of you uh, want to score upwards of 730. Uh, the biggest group is those who are in the 7 to 720. And then about 7% of you are in the 600 to 700 bracket. That's wonderful. Let me actually. So let's now go into the webinar pane. This is where we'll host the webinar. So the screen will have changed for you or for many of you it probably still is in the process of changing. So I'm going to wait for another five to seven seconds uh, to allow for that, that change to propagate through worldwide. All right. There's essentially three parts of this webinar. In the first part, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Ichiman. That's going to last about 15 minutes. In the second part, Pyle Tandon, who's your main host, will take over and she's going to get into the, the core of this webinar. And then in the third part, we'll have an open ended Q&A session in which if there's a question that hasn't been hasn't already been answered during the webinar, we'll be happy to take that question up. Also, if you have a question which is related to other aspects of, uh, of your GMAP preparation, not just number properties, or, um, or if there's a question which is around uh, other aspects of, uh, of your MB application, we'd be happy to take it during this third part of the webinar, which is the open-ended uh, uh, Q&A. Let me just make sure I can mark that during this third part of the webinar. All right, with that, let me uh, introduce my, my, my team over here. My name is Rajat Sidana. I'm one of the co-founders of VGMAT, and I am your co-host over here. Your main host today would be Pyle Tendon. Pyle is the other co-founder of, of VGMAT. She's also a GMAT Club's top rated instructor. Um, supporting us during this webinar, uh, we have two folks. We have Ashutosh Mishra, who's a quant subject matter expert, 
and Manus, who's a GMAT strategy expert. Both of them will ensure that any question that you have during this webinar gets answered. So with that, let's start the first part of this webinar, which is an introduction to eGMAT. So early on, I asked this question, which is, hey, what's your target GMAT score? And we saw about 55% of you wanted a score of 730 or higher. And in fact, about 35% of you were in that, uh, or upwards of 35% of you were in that 710, 720 bracket. So while that may be the course, statistically, only 6% of the people get to that score of 720 or higher. And this was despite the fact that these schools continue to demand higher and higher median GMAT scores. So what is it that people who get to these scores to a good percentage of them actually use eGMAT? Why do we say that? When you look at the, the key stats on, on major forums, one is the number of verified reviews. Uh, the second is, is the number of success stories. What you're going to find is that eGMAT gets mentioned more times than do other test, major test prep companies. Um, and then some of these stats are cumulative. For example, this one's over the last uh, few years or so. This one's just over the last 12 months. So what makes our students more successful? I think there's one thing that makes our students more successful. It is our approach to GMAT preparation or the architecture of learning that we provide. And to tell you the, the you know, how the, our architecture of learning or the architecture of learning that our platform delivers differs from the traditional architecture of learning that you really see. Let's look at the predominant learning architectures that you see today. Uh, so there are two popular learning architectures today. One is what we call as a book-based learning architecture, and the second, a private tutor-based learning architecture. So when you map um, the various GMAT courses that you see over here uh, uh, out there, which you know may include audiovisual instruction, may include quizzes, may include assessments, and so on and so forth, what you're going to find is that their core architecture is still this book-based architecture. And when you map eGMAT to one of these two architectures, what you're going to find is that it's much more aligned with that private tutoring-based architecture. So to really see why is one architecture better than the other when it comes to helping you ace the GMAT, let's, uh, let's see how you go about acing the GMAT in an efficient manner. So how do you ace the GMAT? The first thing that you need to do when it comes to acing the GMAT is to have an efficient path towards your target GMAT score, whether that GMAT score is 730 or 760, you need to know based on your strengths, based on your weaknesses, uh, how much, uh, you need to have a good estimate of the amount of time you need, you need to have a really good estimate of where you're gonna spend that time. Um, the second is, uh, is once you know where you're gonna, what your strengths and weaknesses are and where you need to spend time, then you need to learn the concepts that you don't know and, and make sure that you learn it, you master those concepts. Just knowing the concepts wasn't enough. You also need to know how to apply those concepts um, on Unreal GMAT-like problems. And, and you need to get so good at, uh, 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 at applying those concepts that you attain a level of mastery that puts you in that top five, top two, or top one percentile of students. And you need to do this again and again. So not just for one concept, but for, for about all each of those two to 250 concepts that the GMAT tests. Now let's see how a book-based approach tackles this challenge. A book-based approach is all about autonomy, which means that, uh, uh, that that when you study using a book, you get one of many study plans. Now, not one of these study plans is personalized to your strengths and weaknesses, but uh, but you may get a you know quant-driven study plan, a verbal-driven study plan, or a general study plan, and you have to take one of these three plans uh, and, and 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 move forward. Some people have the wherewithal to personalize this. Many people just take these plans as is. Then you start learning concepts using books, and then books can do a really good job of uh, teaching you concepts. The only problem is that uh, that 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 burden of validation as to whether you've learned that concept well enough uh, is is completely on the student. So essentially, when a thousand people go through a certain chapter in a book, they learn to a thousand different degrees. A book would not tell those folks how many of them have actually crossed the threshold when it comes to that level of understanding. One area where books uh, don't do as great a job, in my opinion, is helping you learn how to apply those concepts. Just the very static nature of the book is not very well suited to telling you, hey, well, while approaching a problem, this is what you do in step one, this is what you do in step two, step three, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and so, you know, people who resort to studying using books 
uh, they resort to solving hundreds and hundreds of questions on various forums and some people actually do master application but those are the exception and not the norm and when it comes to evaluation of mastery the book-based approach typically provides mock tests as as the only means of evaluation of mastery and and, and like the application of concepts people who resort to that book-based approach take tens of mock tests and and, and, and essentially uh, uh, you know, that, that evaluation of mastery process is fairly cumbersome and, and it's challenged by the fact that when it comes to evaluating the mock test itself, that onus most of the time is completely on the student. So how does a private tutoring architecture um, uh, solve this problem? When you work with a good private tutor, the first thing that a good private tutor would do is help create a personalized study plan. And that study plan would, would ensure that that you know, you evaluate your strengths, you understand your weaknesses, and then you allocate an appropriate amount of time to, uh, to your strengths and weaknesses. And also, you also get a good estimate of how much time do you need to waste the test. You know, some people need 70 hours, others need 200 hours. And in this step, you, you do that evaluation and figure that out. Then a good private tutor would teach you concepts and constantly evaluate your, your, your ability to absorb that concept and, and, and give you feedback on the same. One area where a private tutoring architecture outperforms the book-based architecture is when it comes to teaching you how to apply those concepts. Why? Because a good private tutor will tell you what you need to do in step one, what you need to do in step two, step three, and so on and so forth. And if you falter while solving, a good private tutor will also tell you the step in which you falter. And again, as you're solving questions, a good private tutor will evaluate your, your uh, your extent of mastery that you retain, and then at an appropriate time will tell you now it's mo time to move on from one uh, area to the other, whether it's moving from number properties to algebra or sentence correction to critical reasoning. So what's the difference? Essentially, while you're learning the same concepts in both these approaches, uh, the extent of application, the extent of feedback, the extent of personalization is a lot more in private tutor-based approach. It's very easy to see why that approach is more successful. So let's see why do we say that most of these other courses out there are built around this book-based approach, whereas EG Maths built around this private tutoring-based architecture. We're going to really map the solutions provided uh, uh, on, on each of these steps. So let's start on with the first step. So if you want to get to a score of 720 or higher, and, and we're going to take a base case of a student who wants to improve from a score of 600 to a 720, um, how would both these approaches work? Or how would how do we solve these problems versus how do other prep companies start to solve these problems? So how do you go about doing this? The first thing, and, and forgive me for, for the jumble up over here, but, but essentially, if you want to create a personalized study plan, you need to define your starting abilities. You need to then uh, define how would you get to uh, your target score, and then you need to personalize your course. So how do you define your starting point, which essentially is your strengths and weaknesses? The way you go about defining this is you take a Sigma X mock test. Why do you take a Sigma X mock test? Because it's the only mock test that can tell you your arithmetic ability or algebra ability can tell your SCCR and RC ability. So in addition to give you, giving you a score out of 800, in addition to giving you a quantum verbal score, it will also tell you these abilities. Uh, the only other way today to get these abilities is to take an official GMAT exam and then and spend another 30 bucks to get an ESR. So that's about an expense of $280 over there. Or you take a Sigma X mark and you get these abilities. Then you need to define how are you gonna get to that 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 target score of yours and what's the most efficient way for you to get to that target score how do you do that you define milestones using our ai driven study planner called gmat planner so how does this planner work it takes in your current quant and verbal scores and it actually can take in these sub components within the quant score sub components within the verbal score it can then recommend a target quant and a target verbal score that you can really see over here and again, you have complete flexibility as, as, as you get the recommendation. You can actually change one of these scores and the other one automatically adjusts. Then based on that, it can tell you how will you get to a Q50? How can you get to a V38? What's the shortest path for you to get to a Q50 and a V38? And, and, and when this happens, your entire GMAT journey becomes a set of five milestones. 
For example, in arithmetic, you now need to go from a 59th percentile to an 83rd percentile. In sentence correction, you need to go from a 50th percentile to an 89th percentile. So your GMAT journey is divided into five separate sub journeys. If you hit those sub journeys, you can be very certain that you're gonna hit that target GMAT score. Because you have precise starting and ending points, this tool can go further and, and calculate the amount of effort you need because you have these starting abilities, your target milestones, and you can really see the time that you need to devote per subsection. And over here, for example, it's very clear you need to spend a lot more time in SC than you need to do in RC just because you're aiming for a much higher target ability in SC than in, um, than in RC. So when this happens, your personalized GMAT preparation and even on either quant or verbal side uh, becomes these three sub preparations. Not only that, it can even tell you what to study when based on the amount of time that you spend every day. And again, you may not be able to read this, but this says, hey, how many hours can you spend during the weekdays? How many hours per day can you spend during the weekend? What is your starting date? And what is your ending date? So why don't we go about building this utility that, uh, that allows you to create your study plan in less than seven minutes so that each one of you can create that personalized study plan. A personalized study plan that delivers better performance than a study plan that you create while working with a private tutor. Now the next step is, is teaching you how to, um, you know, teaching you the concepts and giving you feedback on this. To do that, in the EGMAT learning architecture, we've created uh, uh, specific files called concept files. These files have evaluations built into them. Um, now, when you compare this to, to some of the other files, um, you know, I'm going to compare again like by like files uh, in another course, uh, which is by, by Magoosh, to really see how does the structure of these files, uh, you know, how does the structure differ from, from that in the EGMAT course. So, this is the internal architecture of an EGMAT concept file. What you really see is a very clear definition of, of what each entity is. Um, you also see um, detailed audio visual solution and these solutions come with animations over here. So you don't see all of this information at one time, but you see it one after the other. In addition to that, uh, 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 you also see practice questions right after this, as you can really see, this is a practice question over here right after learning the concepts so you, you're evaluated on that. And, and, and you are asked to apply uh, your learning right then and there. When you compare this to the Magoosh course, what you're gonna find is that it's, it's, not, it's designed to be like a book in an audio visual format. And, and, and that learning is fairly passive. There's no evaluation within, within the course itself. The next piece is teaching you how to apply those concepts. And within the EGMAD offering, You'll have, you have specific application files in which we teach you how to apply the concepts. Then you have practice quizzes right after those where you can evaluate your ability to apply those concepts. And then we also give you very specific practice on official questions. And this is how every module in the EGMAT course, whether it's a quant module or a verbal module is architected. When you compare this with the Magoosh offering, and, and this is the learning part of Magoosh offering, what you really see is that, you know, there is no application file number one. There is, however, a practice file, which is common, not just to divisibility, but also to primes, also to DCD, LCD, and also to, to, to cases and executive in, uh, consecutive integers. Um, also, this quiz, you know, with five questions has no scores over here. So the, the goal over here is to, to give you practice and not feedback. Now, why is this important? The reason why it's important is because your goal is to hit a high 80th percentile in algebra and not just to learn algebra. Um, and, and, and you only hit that 80th or that 90th percentile when you learn things properly and you learn things properly uh, uh, when, when you get feedback on, um, on, on, on the areas that you've missed out on. And, and, by building this architecture, you get in-place feedback by creating that content in this particular manner. We ensure when you go through the course and, and you, you receive that feedback and you act upon it, by the time you reach your assessments, you are ready to hit that 80th percentile or so. 
The next piece is evaluation of mastery. You know, we talked about study plan. We talked about learning concepts. We talked about application of concepts. Let's now look at how do we master the challenge of evaluation of mastery. We built a product called Scholaranium, and, uh, and in Scholaranium, you can take an ability quiz. In this case, we're talking about the, the quiz that we're showing is an algebra ability quiz. The beauty of this is that when you take a few quizzes, we, we uh, accumulate stats such that uh, you can really see uh, what your score in algebra is, but also you can see where you're faulting. So in this case, it's very clear that this person needs to go revise the functions module within the EGMAT course, come back, take another ability quiz, and, and, and you know once he improves his ability in functions and inequalities over here, this guy can expect to perform a lot better going forward. So what are the key differences between two approaches? You can really see that, but one of the things that you can also see um, why we say that EGMAT's built around that private tutoring-based architecture, whereas uh, most of the other courses are built around this book-based approach. Who's created this architecture? Four out of GMAT Club's top five rated instructors have created this architecture. Architecture, I'm sorry. Instructors uh, who've been reviewed a lot more frequently on GMAT Club. So while only 6% of the people get to that score of 720 or higher, a good number, you can see why we say a good number of them do use EGMAN and why people are more successful with it. With that, um, come to the end of the first part of my introduction. If you want to stay updated with all things EGMAT, if you want to get our, um, invites to our future webinars um, or read articles on, on, on stuff going on in the B school and MBA world, you're welcome to connect with me on my LinkedIn. I have upwards of 12,000 students connected with me on my LinkedIn. Most of these students also are studying at other top B schools. If you want to connect with, an, connect with alumni at other top B schools, this would be an excellent way to do so. With that, I've come to the end of the first part of this webinar. I will now invite Payal Tandon, who's GMAT Club's top rated instructor, um, and also the other co-founder of EGMAT to start the second part of this webinar. Thank you, Rajat, for that wonderful introduction. Hello, welcome, and every hello, good morning, good evening, and welcome everyone to Number Properties 2 webinar in which we're going to talk about how is it that you can ace number properties. My name is Payal Tandon, and I am happy to be here with you to guide you through this um, through this GMAT journey. Um, all right, so everyone can hear me clearly. That sounds good. So let's uh, begin this session with first understanding what is it that, um, what is the purpose of this session? So before I go there, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Tell me what is um, getting in the way of you acing GMAT quant? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? All right, let's get some more responses going here. Time management, understanding the question clearly, lack of conceptual clarity, word problems thrown off by complex wording. Okay, random silly mistakes. Okay, careless mistakes. Now, when you say time management, what do you mean exactly? Do you mean that um, you don't have enough time to solve questions? I mean, how much longer do you take on a per question basis? Pressure of maintaining time, okay? All right. Now, tell me one thing. How many of you are, uh, how many of you are targeting a score above Q, or Q, above Q48? So how many of you are targeting a score of Q49 or 50 or 51? Okay. Almost everyone, 90% of the class. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Now, what we're going to do in this session is we are, my main intent over here is to make sure that you understand what is the key to async GMAT quant. 
and by that what i there are two main two two most important things one is sound understanding of basics which is your conceptual understanding and the other is having that step by step method to solve questions okay how many of you here today believe that they do have a structured approach to solving uh, quant questions and i know this may be a very subjective question because what do you call as a, sub, a structured approach okay but what you what i see over here is that more than 75% of the class does not have a, a structured approach to solving quant questions and that is a very very important thing so again both of these things are absolutely critical if you are targeting a score of even q48 q49 q50 you really need to you you really need to have um, that absolute crystal clear understanding of concepts and what i call that as is 200% clarity in concepts 100% is not enough it's it should be 200% and i'll tell you what i mean by that as we go through this session okay so those are the two things that we're going to do now how are we going to progress through the session i want to first tell you what is it that we are targeting okay um as 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 majority of you 90% of the class is targeting a score above q48 we need to i want to i want to set that similar target in this session as well so i am going to give you three data sufficiency questions they are all 700 level plus right and you will be solving those questions and there are three questions here you will be solving them back to back and it's going to be your goal to understand how is it that you can solve those three questions in the right applying the structured process what kind of conceptual clarity is required okay now it may so happen that you will not be able to solve those questions correctly up front but then as we build up the conceptual understanding of yours through the warm up exercises that we have through the uh, through the uh, uh, through the problem solving questions three problem solve easier problem solving questions that we do and then again a little bit more difficult problem solving questions that we do when we get back to solving these three questions again towards the end i will i would want to see some improvement in accuracy again i'm not guaranteeing that everyone will be able to solve these questions correctly because it does take time to absorb these concepts okay but everyone will definitely get a very solid idea about how what do i mean by that 200% clarity what do i mean by that structured approach towards uh, quant questions okay so let's get going again the first part over here will be solving only i'm not going to be discussing the solutions now one thing that i do want to specify is that um a number of you talked about um time management being being the number one issue now in this session you're not going to find that as a problem because we want to keep time as a separate entity okay you do have to work on minty on on working on your time management but that comes after you have built that conceptual understanding that that comes after you have cemented that process in your mind okay so beyond so in so there so there are three stages of learning stage 1 is where you're learning the concepts and the methods stage 2 is where you are cementing those methods and stage 3 is where you work on your test readiness test readiness and stage 3 comes way towards the end right right now we are really in stage 1 for some people and stage 2 for some people so, so we are working on on those two parts right now so that's why we are not going to worry about the time by that what i mean is that when about 30 50% of the class has selected the, the answer i am going to give about 30 second warning for the rest of um, 50% of the class to to put in the answers okay so essentially you you will be maintaining um how much time you as a group will be maintaining how much time i give you for each question okay so are you guys ready to solve these difficult data sufficiency questions on number properties topics and again in this session we are focused on divisibility and remainder type topics so the whole point of this session is that we are taking a small topic and we are telling you what is it that you need to do in order to be able to solve difficult questions from that topic so that you can take the learnings from this session and apply them across the board across entire quant uh, the entire spectrum of quant course okay quant uh, syllabus all right so let's get going with this 
I'm gonna get the ball here. All right, can everyone please click on still solving? All right. There you go, question number eight. Last 30 seconds. All right, I'm going to end this poll now. Before I give you the next question, I do want to ask this question here and just bear with me for a second. I want to know how confident are you of your response? Okay. Go ahead. What's the level of confidence in the selection of the answer choice? All right. Good. Thank you. Now we're going to go to our question number nine here. Okay, let's click on still solving, please. Okay, sounds good. Here you go.
All right, last 30 seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. Okay, so while I bring about bring up the poll for last question, tell me your confidence level for this one. Interesting. So in this case, 50% of the class, about 50% of the class is not confident. And there's hardly any, very few people are absolutely confident. Okay, sounds good. Let's look at question number 10 now. And let's click on still solving. Okay, I'm going to share the question now. Here you go. All right, last 30 seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. And let's check your confidence level for this question. Go ahead.
Okay. So sixty percent of the class is not confident. Right. Okay, sounds good. So how were these three questions? We'll tone down the level of this session a bit now, uh, but let's let's just understand from you how was this? Uh, how were these three questions? Yes, there were seven hundred questions. But what do you feel? How do you feel? A nightmare, tough, very tricky and challenging. Okay, all right, interesting and difficult. Pretty challenging, but could be tackled with a bit of thought. Now, all of these are GMAT level questions. So I don't want you to disregard these questions thinking that these are not GMAT level questions. So, good. And when we get to the solution, you will understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. All right, so let's now get to the warm-up section. We all know what our goal is. Our goal is to be able to solve such questions um, properly right so let's now get to uh, get to our journey to getting to that goal okay so what we're going to do in this warm-up section is we're going to talk about some basic questions on divisibility and remainders we are going to i'm going to give you feedback on your current conceptual knowledge based on how you based on your performance on these uh, warm-up questions and then again i'm not going to be going through the detailed solutions of these questions again the whole point of this warm-up section is to make sure that you have the right kind of conceptual knowledge right and give you feedback on on that conceptual knowledge okay so let's get going here again you will be solving questions but again these are going to be easier questions much easier questions so let's click on still solving Okay, all right, let's get going here. Here's the question. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. All right. So the correct answer for this question is choice B. Now, what is this question asking us? It's asking, it's, it's telling us that the, the Z is a three-digit number, and it's giving us information about the digits of this number, that these digits are consecutive numbers, and we need to select the appropriate statement, and each of these statements is related to divisibility by 3 and what we have to figure out is is z z may be divisible by 3 that is in some cases z is or is not divisible or is z always divisible by 3 no matter what or z is not at all divisible by 3 so the correct answer here is choice b now the divisibility rule for 3 is some of the digits should be divisible by 3 now what am i going to do here what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because I know that the digits are consecutive numbers, so what I'm going to do is assume my digits to be x, x plus 1. If, if one digit is x, the other one will be x plus 1, the other one will be x plus 2 because they are consecutive. Now, so what is the sum of these digits? The sum is 3x plus 3. I take 3 as common. So no matter what the value of x is, that is no matter what the first digit is, always 
this number z is going to be divisible by 3 because it has because it is a multiple of 3 okay so the correct answer here is choice b now for those of you who selected choice a did you not apply this method most likely what i'm guessing is that you applied um uh, well i don't even know for what method you applied so why did you miss out on this question about 25 percent of the class did miss out on this question so tell me where did you falter people who selected choice a which part of the solution were you not able to implement and again i'm not going into the detail of the solution these solutions the discussion and the solution is meant are, are meant to tell you where you are lacking so that you can go into the course and you can bridge those gaps so let's see tested cases but did not test for divisibility okay not sure what you mean by that the question is about divisibility did not use proper method okay um, and then missed consecutive number test text okay well so you didn't read the question so again that is a very very important thing you need to read the question okay so if you don't you have to extract all the information if you remember what we did over here was uh, so when I when I when I took a look at this question, how I looked at it was I first read the entire question statement, I absorbed the information, and then I saw okay I have to select the correct statement. Now what is the correct statement about? The correct statement is really about divisibility by three. And what are my choices telling me? My choices are telling me that z may be divisible, or z is always divisible, or z is not divisible. So really, so by looking at the question statement and looking at the answer choices. I am coming up with my approach here to say, okay, I need to figure out what, given the information, can I say something with with sure shot um, uh, confidence that regarding the divisibility of the number by the number three? Okay. Now, what you are, okay, so wrote n plus okay. So again, I hope that all of you do understand where you falter. Okay, it's you have to you have to make sure don't disregard this as a silly mistake because none of the reasons that you mentioned over here uh, amount to being them being silly mistakes okay these are you have to get to the bottom of why is it that you made these mistakes okay all right let's now move on to our next question here okay let me first Okay, click on still solving, please. All right, here you go. All right, last 15 seconds. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. 
I will get to this question, but let me first answer one doubt that a couple of students have asked if, for the previous question. Now, the doubt that these students are asking is that um, what we have done is we have taken the sum of digits, but we haven't really added up the three, we haven't really come up with the three numbers. So what they're saying is that the solution should have been 100x plus 10x plus 1 plus x plus 2, and we should have added those numbers to get to the answer. Now, you guys are also right, but what you are doing is you're coming up with the number and you're dividing that entire number by 3 to see if that number is divisible by 3 or not. What we are doing is we are doing the divisibility test. Now, this divisibility test, wherein we simply take sum of digits and divide them by 3 to see if the sum of digits are divisible by, if, if the number is divisible by 3, is actually derived from that same mechanism that you are talking about. So if you go through, and this is in, this is discussed in detail in our concept file regarding divisibility uh, by numbers. So definitely go through that concept file because we talk about how is it that you arrive at the divisibility rule. Okay, so you guys are right, but then again, in the test, you need to be utilizing these um, these divisibility rules and not going the long route of actually coming up with the exact number and then dividing that number by three. And that's what and 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 the, so the conceptual understanding that you need to have is that you need to understand what the divisibility rules of numbers are. Okay, so I hope that clarifies your doubt. Because a couple of students asked that doubt, that's the reason why I wanted to clarify that. Okay, so now let's come to this question over here. Uh, question number four, again, similar question, but the approach is going to be based on the divisibility rule of the number four. Okay, we will not, so how many of you actually applied the same method? That is, you took the numbers as x, x plus one, x plus two, x plus three, how many of you did that? Okay. Now, that will not work here. Why? Because the divisibility rule of 4 is does not link with the num sum, of, sum of digits of the number. That method worked, assuming the digits as x, x plus 1, x plus 2, x plus 3. That approach worked for previous question because in the previous question, we knew that the sum of digits of the number need to be divisible by 3 for the entire number to be divisible by 3. right? And that's the reason why we then took the numbers as x, x plus 1, x plus 2, x plus 3. Here, uh, here we have a four digit. We, we need to carefully figure out the divisibility by the number 4. Now, what is the divisibility rule by number 4? It is that the last two digits should be divisible by 4. Okay. Now, how do we do that? What do we do over here is we consider certain cases here. Now, last two digits divisible by 4. Now, last two digits, if the digits are consecutive numbers, can be odd right, and can be even. Right? So you have to consider those cases. Now, why are we considering the cases of even odd? Because 4 is an even number. right? So we, we can now split the entire spectrum of numbers into, into those categories here. That's the, uh, uh, into odd, even and odd categories. right? So we could have an example of 2, 3, 4, 5 over here, consecutive numbers. But again, z is odd, so it's not divisible by 4. So you already have a case in which z is not divisible by 4. Now, there are other cases in which z can be an even number. Now, in even number also, you have different cases. You have the cases such that the last two digits are divisible by 4. For example, 3, 4, 5, 6, here 56 is divisible by 4. Or you may have cases in which the last two digits are not divisible by 4. For example, 1, 2, 3, 4. 34 is not divisible by 4. So really, you have certain cases in which z, z is not divisible by 4. And you have certain cases in which z is definitely divisible by 4. Which means that the correct answer is choice, choice A. That is, z may be divisible by 4. So less than half of the class selected this choice as the correct answer. Now, where did you guys falter? For those of you, first of all, my question is, for those of you who, uh, who selected choice A, did you approach it in this manner? Did you consider these cases of z being odd, z being even, and then in even as well, there being two different cases? 
okay so not everyone use that method all right so tell me for those of you who who selected choice a but will but not using this method what what method did you use last question approach and that would not have worked he didn't try okay all right now let me ask questions uh, let me ask those students more than 50 percent of the class that did not select the correct answer Okay, so there are some of you who are saying who use the 10C plus D divisible by 4 approach. That is also fine. But then again, you should have you should have had to use certain cases here. 2 times 2x plus 3, that's what you will get. So you, you will need to utilize certain cases here, right? Because if a number is divisible by 2, does not necessarily mean that the number will be divisible by 4 as well. Right, so again, the whole point is that you have to take the cases. So these, this case over here, this is where the the the, uh, the substance of the question is. Wherein you know you if if you do not consider when z is even, if you do not consider these two cases, that's when the problem arises. Okay, so again, you have to be very you you need to consider the the various cases that are applicable. Okay. All right, so now let's move on to our next question here. All right, let's get you all to click on still solving. Well, let me give you, no, sorry. I, this one has four answer choices. Let me give you the right, right poll. Yeah, now click on still solving. Okay, here you go. Okay, last 10 seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. So now here, we have to talk about uh, what is the number closest to this number. That's a multiple of 8. Now, the divisibility rule for 8 is that last three digits should be divisible by 8. So we only have to worry about the last three digits, which are over here 897. Now 897 divided by 8 gives us the remainder as 1. So the closest number to this number that is divisible by 8 will be 896. So that when you divide 896 by 8, there is rem the remainder is 0. Okay, so very straightforward question. I believe even the ones who were not able to select the answer choice would have been able to get to the answer here if I'd given a little bit more time. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears a bit and we'll get into remainders. Um, so let's get going there here. Let me open up the poll. Can you please click on still solving? All right, go ahead.
Okay, last 10 seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. Now, this question, I know that most of you have been able to answer this question correctly. But I do know that the method that I'm going to explain to you is not the method that most of you would have used. In fact, very few people would have used that method. But in this session, I do want you to try to apply the approach that I'm telling you. So why I'm making that as an explicit uh, uh, thing before even showing you the method is so that I, so that you remain open to accepting this method, right? I want you to understand what I'm doing because I do want you to apply this method through this session, okay? And then, and I will explain to you why that is the case, okay? So, the concept that I'm applying over here is that dividend is equal to divisor times quotient plus remainder. This is your remainder equation uh, typical remainder equation, right? Now, what is given to you? If a number n leaves a remainder 3 when divided by 204, 204. So what I need to do here is I need to express this in terms of the equation that I've just written over here, right? So what is that? W what, what I get to is, uh, okay, I'll get to that later. Uh, the animation over here is for what is the remainder when n is divided by 4. So really translating this into this equation, what we get is n is equal to 4p plus r. Here p is the quotient and r is the remainder. And again, our divisor is 4. Okay, so all I'm doing is what is, uh, what is asked of me, I've simply put that in terms of this equation over here. Now I do the same thing over here. What is given to me, I put that in terms of this equation. And what do I get? I get n is equal to 204 is the divisor, 204 times q, q is the assumed quotient plus the remainder 3. Okay. So, so far all of you are with me as to what I'm doing over here. All I'm doing is taking the equations that are given to me, taking the information in the question that's given to me, and I'm putting that information in this particular equation that all of us are aware of, right? Now what I have to do is, what, what do I need to find out? I need to find out this value r, and I do know that r is less than 4. Why is r less than 4? Why is the remainder less than 4 in this case? Remainder is always less than the divisor, absolutely, because we are dividing by 4. Absolutely. Good. Good. Very nice. Okay. So now, I need to find out R. Now, in, now look at this. On both the sides, the number is the same. N is the same. Right? So, if I simply express this number in terms of 4 over here, then I can figure out the value of R. Essentially, what I'm doing is, I'm simply thinking, so what I do know is 204Q plus 3, this part over here, is equal to 4P plus R. Right? Everyone with me over here? 204Q plus 3 is equal to 4P plus R. So if I can simply see, is, is 204Q E similar to 4p. I mean, can I write 204q in terms of 4p? I can, right? 204q is nothing but a multiple of 4 over here, right? So, in a sense, because 204q is a multiple of 4, I can simply write n as 4 into 51q plus 3, which means that my remainder is 3. So, all I'm doing is I'm expressing this number in terms of 4p so that I can get the value of r. Okay, so do one thing, just, just look at the slide once, this portion of the slide once more and see if you got what I have done over here because this is the most important step.
Okay, so all of you got it? Okay, let me explain this a little bit better to you if you haven't gotten it yet. Because again, this is important. All right, so what do I have over here? Is This is the number N here. This is also the number N, right? So what I have is, okay, I'm trying to write this down. Give me one second, guys. Just trying to figure this out. Hmm. For some reason, this is very, very dim. Yeah. So 204Q plus 3 is equal to 4P plus R, right? Now, if I can express this number in terms of this, then R will be, so again, over here, Q and P are quotients, right? And four is four is the quotient, four is the multiple here, and two or four is the multiple here. So if some, if I can figure out if two or four can be expressed in terms of multiple of four, then I can I can basically figure out what the what the non multiple of four value will be, right? So that's what I'm doing. And in this case, two or four Q happens to be a multiple of four. So essentially. This number is already of the form 4P, so whatever is the remaining number, so R is actually equal to 2, 3. Okay, so that's what I'm doing over here. And that's why the remainder is 3. Now again, you would have been able to solve this question in, in your own way in which you, you would have divided, you would have figured out what the value of N is. And, and then you would have divided n by 4. And you could have done it that way as well. But again, that method will work right now on this question, but it's not going to work across the board on questions that get a little bit more difficult. And we are going to be talking about that. Okay? So let's now move on to our next question over here. Now, what is this process? This this skill is known as process. This process skill is known as visualization, wherein you are taking a look at the information that's given to you, and you are trying to figure out how is it that you can extract more information, and how and how is it that you can get to the answer utilizing the two set of equations that are given to you. Okay. All right, so now let's move on to our next question, and I would want you to apply the same technique on this question as well. Do not solve by calculation. Okay, I want you to write down the equations, and I want you to get to the answer that way. Okay? All right, go ahead. All right, almost all of you are done. 
so let's broadcast the results so okay i would say more than half of the class got the question correct and if i tell you one small thing you everyone would have gotten this question correct okay so which means that yeah so let me just talk about this so the number n leaves the remainder 6 when divided by 2 or 5 what is the remainder when n is divided by the number 5 so so let's just get everyone to to get to the correct answer for those of you who have selected the answer as 6 what is the divisor over here we we have to figure out the remainder right remainder when n is divided by 5 what is the divisor here the divisor is 5 so can your remainder be less can your remainder be 6 then if the divisor is 5 can the remainder be 6 no so for those of you who selected choice d what do you think the answer is absolutely the answer is choice a so how people who selected choice d and about half of the class had selected choice d if this question if you were solving this question on your own and if you were maintaining an error log what is the error that you would have written down corresponding to this question so my question is for people who selected choice d and that's half of the class if you were if you were maintaining your error log what you would what you would have logged as the error 5 is divisor so remainder should be less than 5 good remainder is less than divisor absolutely absolutely i'm glad that none of you are saying that it it was a silly mistake oh i i remembered that remainder so oh i just missed out on a small point good very nice very nice all right so now let me figure out how did you solve this question how many of you did the calculation here okay how many of you solved the method that i had used for question number 4 and let me just bring out the method over here so notice over here what am i doing i'm writing down the constraint it's very very important to write down the constraints here okay now i have these two equations n is equal to 5q n is equal to 5p plus r what am i doing and both the sides contain n right which means i can equate the right hand side of both these equations and i can see okay which ones are so, so can i split them into into things such that i get i get r as the remainder and that's what i'm doing over here i get r is equal to 6 okay so i get r is equal to 6 but then i have to keep in mind my constraint over here the constraint is r is less than 5 so then i divide 6 by 5 again and i get the remainder as 1 okay all right so good i'm glad that all of you were able to apply the visualization skill now the visualization skill is right now it's the Uh, I would say tier one application of visualization skill. Now, if you notice in both the questions, the the uh, the numbers were such that you know the the number over here was already a multiple of the number over here, right? So we didn't really have to do much of manipulation. Okay, but as we go forward, you will be required to make certain manipulations. Okay, so that's what we're going to be working on next. All right, so let's now summarize what are the learnings from this warm-up section. Let me ask you: How many of you answered at least one question incorrectly? At least one question incorrectly. In a sense, what I'm asking is that people who who were able to answer all five questions correctly, click on no. people who were not able to answer all five questions correctly click on yes okay so my feedback to you is okay about 80% of the class was not able to get 100% score in these five questions so my feedback to you is you need to get that 200% clarity in concepts be very very critical of yourself okay 
take a look at the questions that you did not get right okay because these warm up questions are things that you should know you should be able to solve with that with just without without even thinking much through it okay right so you need to get to that level of clarity in your concepts okay now and this is precisely what i mean by this 200% clarity when i say 200% clarity i don't just mean that you need to know your you need to know the divisibility rule of 3 that you need to know the divisibility rule of 4 this 200% clarity also indicates that you need to be able to apply those concepts in order to solve easy questions okay now an easy question is not going to simply have have you apply the divisibility rule of 3 without any manipulation without any thinking through okay and that is where that 200% clarity is required okay so all of you understand what do i mean by 200% clarity okay good now let's move on to our next section in which we're going to take up a little bit more difficult questions okay but we're going to carry forward with the same theme here's the question and again you you'll notice that this this also has similar similar theme of uh, remainder equation and let me get you the poll here give me one second guys i don't want you to be start solving the question here it is Yes. All right. Go ahead. Again, apply the same method that that we have spoken about in this. In, and in this question, you will need to do a bit of manipulation. last 10 seconds all right i'm going to end the poll okay how many of you solved this question by calculation that is you figured out what what the value of m is and then you divided that by 15 Okay. Now, while that method works absolutely fine for this question, this question is an easier question. I do want you to. Uh, so, it's okay for you to do to solve this question in this manner in the exam. It's absolutely fine. But I want you to make sure that you know how to approach um, such visualization. How to build your visualization skills and building of such process skills starts with um, solving easier questions so that you are equipped to apply these visualization skills on difficult questions. So let me tell you what I mean by that. Okay. Um, so the correct answer here is choice C. Six is the answer. So again, what we need to figure out is what is the remainder when m is divided by fifteen. So fifteen is our divisor and we have to find out this remainder now what information do we know about the, uh, the about this number n what we know is over here n is a positive integer and n when divided by 30 gives you 8.2 as the answer okay so what what, it, what this really tells me is n is equal to 30 times 8.2 now what i can do over here is i have to basically if you think about it this is a number here 30 into 8.2 if somehow 
I can write this number such that term A is multiple of 15. Okay. And the other term is not a multiple of 15. Okay. If I can write this number N in this form, then I will be able to get to my value R. Is that right? Yes or no? Is it clear as to what I'm trying to do here? I, I have been given some information about N here. Okay. And I already noticed that N, that this 30 is a multiple of 15. Now, somehow, if I can express this number here, this singular number here, into two terms such that one term is a multiple of 15 and the other term is not a multiple of 15, then I can get to my remainder. Okay. That is what I will try to do over here now. Okay. And let me erase this here. So, what I'm doing is I'm doing 30 times 8 plus 30 times 0.2. Okay. How, 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 how have I gotten that? 8 plus 0.2 okay 30 into 8 plus 0.2 that's what so I have opened up 8.2 okay and then what do I get I then and um, what am I doing over here is I am simply coming up with, so with with the terms such that so I'm grouping the terms of multiple of 15 to so such that I get multiple of 15s on one side and I get the number 6 on the other side. I get the non-multiple of 15 on the other side. That is what I'm doing over here. Okay? Okay? So the remainder is 6. How many of you get this method here? Okay, what do you not get? How it is done? A little time to comprehend. Okay. Division of 8.2 where you put n is equal to 30 into 8.2. Okay. I'm just reading through what is it that you're not able to get over here. So let me see how is it that I can simplify this further for you. Give me one second here, guys. Okay. Um, Okay, let's do it this way. 30 into 8. Okay. 30 multiplied by 8. How can you write 30? You can write 30 as 15 into 2 into 8. Right? Which is what I'm doing over here. Remember, what is it that I need to find? I need to bring out these, this term as a multiple of 15. So that is what I'm doing over here. What I'm doing over here is What I'm writing 30 as is 15 times 2 and then I already have 8 over here. Okay, and that is what you see over here. And what is 30 times 0.2? 30 times 0.2 is the number 6 here. And that's all. So now I've been able to get 15, I have, I've been able to get one term that's a multiple of 15 and the other term that is not a multiple of 15. So that is what I'm doing. Is this clear now? Again, you just have to take a look at the equations. Okay? 
Good, nice. I can see that the number of people who are clicking on yes has, has increased. Simple to get to, but difficult to get in terms of 15 immediately. Okay. Again, that's where you have to do, you have to keep in mind to what avail are you doing this? Okay, so good. I have a question here, but how did you actually get this idea? So, so I believe what you are trying to still ask me is, how did I think about splitting the numbers in this form? And that's a very good question. So let's let so let's look at this over here. What am I doing? Again, keep in mind what is it that we are. What is our goal? Our goal is to be able to express the number n in terms of two numbers. One in terms of sum of two numbers. One. Uh, one of those numbers needs to be multiple of 15. The other number needs not to be, should not be a multiple of 15. Okay, that is what, so everyone with me on that? And again, I know that you were able to solve this question correctly. Okay, but again, I want to make sure that you understand this method here. Good, all right. Now, what do, ha what do I have over here? I have n as 13 to 8.2. So I have some more information given to me about the number n, right? So I, and I already know that 30 is actually a multiple of 15. So that's good for me. So I, I am in the, so I have numbers that are really my friends here. So my, the, the numbers are not really out of the, um, so the numbers are not making it difficult for me. The numbers are, are selected in such manner that, that they're making it easy for me. So now what I do is I know 8 is equal to 8 is, e 8.2 is equal to 8 plus 0.2. I know that. Right? So all I'm doing is, okay, 30 times 8 plus 0.2. Let me now split it because I know that if I have 30 multiplied by some other number, it would, that number would still be a multiple of 15. So that is how I am grouping them and I am coming up with making sure that I, I get as many multiples of 15 out of this as possible. And that's what I'm doing over here. So now I get 30 times 8 which is nothing but, so I bring out 15, so I have 2 times 8, and then 13 to point 0.2 is 6, which is not a multiple of 15. Okay, so that's how. Okay, all right, so now I think everyone does get an idea. And again, this is a process skill that we are building, visualization process skill. Now, again, why am I harping so much on this method? I am not really big on you having just a single method to solve questions, not at all. But I am very big on you developing these process skills. And there are five very key process skills that you need to be able to develop. Okay. One is visualization. Okay. Uh, which is what I'm talking about over here. And as you start to the visualization process skill that you apply, uh, that you learn in, in, in such questions, is also going to be applicable to visualization that you apply in algebra question or visualization that you apply in word problems questions. Okay. So again, your process skill remains the same. And that's why as you start to build your ability to apply that process skill, your ability to solve other kinds of questions also improves. Okay. And that is the reason why I want you to solve these questions in this manner so that you build your visualization skills. Okay. Is this point clear? Again, remember the goal of this session, my goal here when solving questions is not just to get to the correct answer. My goal here is to make sure that you learn the right way and you learn, you build your process skills such that you are able to transfer those skills across the board. Okay, and that is why I'm spending the time that I'm spending, even though most of you were able to get to the correct answer. But I want to make sure that you get to the correct answer as you, by building the process skills. Okay, all right. So now let's take a look at the next question here, question number two. So there's just a, one thing that has changed. I've actually reversed the numbers here. In the previous question, you had m divided by 30 is equal to 8.2 and your divisor was 15. In this question, I have actually replaced the two. Okay, so I'm going to bring back the question pod. So try applying the same process. Okay, take a bit of time. Just observe. Don't get to solving right away. Create your two equations and just observe them. 
Okay, please do not do calculation here. Please do not do calculation. What I meant by that was don't solve the question by simply calculating the value of m because then you, ha you will have bypassed the whole process skill building exercise. All right. Tell me. So all of you got to the correct answer. Choice C is the correct answer here. A majority of you got to the correct answer. Now tell me, how many of you applied the method that we talked about, applied the process skill that we've been talking about? Good. Any comments on, on on them? So let me just so let me just walk you through the process here, and then I'm going to ask you because this is where the crux of this session is. It's a lot quicker. Yes, good. So again, same thing. M is equal to 30 p plus r, and when I take a look at this, I have to what what do I need to do? I need to express n in terms of two numbers, sum of two numbers. Wherein first number is multiple of 30, the other number is not a multiple of 30. Okay, all right. So now, what what have I been given? I've been given m is equal to 15 times 8.2. Okay, so now I have to manipulate this this number such that I get one such that I get to these two terms. Okay, that is what I have to do. I need to manipulate this such that I get to these two terms. Okay. All right, so now what do I do? Now over here, obviously, 15 times 8 is, I can I can obviously write down 15 times 2 times 4, okay, which means that this is 30, and then I get 15 times 0.2 as 3. Right? 15 times 0.2 as 3, and that's what my answer is. Remainder is 3. Okay? All right. Let's solve one more question applying the same method here. Good. All right. Let's go to the next question here. All right. 
Oh, I was broadcasting the results. <laughs> okay. The correct answer is choice E. Um, and let's see. How many of you were able to apply the process here as well? The visualization skill. Okay, good. I'm glad to see that the that the yes bar has been increasing consistently. I'm really very really happy. And this is what happens usually in this session. The first question is where people are a little are a little bit doubtful about okay, how 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 do I go about it? But then when they start to see things for themselves and they start to practice the right kind of questions, they are able to build their confidence in applying the process skill. And that's the beauty of having the right kind of progression in the examples. And that's something that you'll see it all throughout the quant course. So, so let's look at this. Um, again, you have m is equal to 30p plus r. Okay. So again, you have to get m. You have to express this. This uh, you have to express this, and and see how you can express this in terms of two terms. One that's multiple of 30, and the other that's not multiple of 30. Okay. So now in this one, you have to do a bit more manipulation. Okay, so if you look at this, you have 15 times 9, right? So again, you have to extract as many terms of 30 as possible. So you write down 9 as 8 plus 1, okay? All right, so you write down 9 as 8 plus 1. So then now you split, you know, 15 times 8 and then 15 plus 1. So what are you doing? You're trying to get the, you're trying to get non-multiples of 15 out of, of here or non-multiples of 30 out of here. Now, why have you split that into 8 plus 1 and not 6 uh, and not, let's say, 7 plus 2? Because you know that in 8, you are going to get 2, which means you are going to get 30 as a multiple. Okay, so that's how you are doing the manipulation. That's the thought process that's going on in your head because ultimately this is what we are getting at. Okay. All right, and this is what you get. All right. And you're absolutely right. It does take a little bit of time to pivot from the commonly used approach to this approach. I absolutely agree. And that's the reason why I'm not rushing you guys into it. That's the reason why I'm not saying that the method that you are applying to, to solve these questions is, is wrong. No, that method is absolutely correct. But that method is going to work on smaller numbers. Right now, I do have smaller numbers here. As the numbers get bigger, you do need to have a method that is not that calculation intensive because remember, GMAT is not a test of calculations. Okay, GMAT is a test of how is it that you can break down a given problem into smaller chunks into more simplified form. Okay, so while the calculation method will work with, with smaller numbers, and especially, you know, numbers such as 15 or 4 or 6, but as the numbers get bigger, such calculations will not really be very, very ideal in the test environment. Okay, and that's the reason why you need to have a sure shot process that can work across the board regardless of the size of numbers. All right, okay. So now uh, let's go forward. So I do see one person saying lost me. Again, just just after the session, I, I will be sharing the PDF with you. Just look at these equations and see how is it that we are getting to it. You will get it. I, I assure you, you will get it. If, if you got the previous two problems, you are going to get this one too. Okay. But again, for your sake, I will explain it a little bit more. So again, all we are doing is 15 times 9 plus 15 times 0.2. I have to get number multiple of 30. So I'm distribute, so I'm splitting 9 as 8 plus 1. Why am I doing 8 plus 1? Because I know 8 is an even number. So um, 8 multiplied by 15 will definitely have 30 multiplied by some something else, right? 30 multiplied by 4. So that is why I'm, I'm splitting it as 8 plus 1. And then 15 plus 1 is 15 plus 3. So I get 18 as the remainder here. Okay. All right. So let's revise. Let's do a recap of this section here. Again, the main thing that we learned over here was uh, visualization skills, okay? And what we had here was a very, very progressively increasing set of examples, okay? 
In the first example, it was relatively straightforward. Second example, we switched the numbers and we had a bit more manipulation to do. Third example, as you can see, the number of steps have increased. So there's a lot more manipulation to be done. Okay, But really speaking, the, the whole point of this was to introduce you to this process skill called as visualization. Okay, now what do you guys think of whatever we have done till now? Gather your thoughts together and tell me. Good. 20% I meant 200%, right? <laughs> um, every question, the visibility example have been very helpful. Good. It's quicker method, good methods across the board. Absolutely good. Need to practice on bigger numbers, right? Absolutely. Very nice. Okay. pretty underconfident right now everything is new makes quant scary again i don't want any of you to feel that you are not confident again the whole point of this session is that we, we are telling you the importance of so if you so if you think about it what we have done so far is we've told you the exam the importance of having that 200 percent clarity in concepts okay that's what we did with the warm-up questions now in this second section what we did was we we told you the importance of building those process skills okay so you need to focus on that so, which again means that as you are solving questions don't just uh, and as you're going through your your prep material don't keep as a goal that you have to solve the question that's that's in front of you by hook or by crook no make sure that you review the solutions and make sure that you the, the solutions that are provided to you in the egmat course there is a reason why those solutions are written, are written the way they are written right they they teach you the process that you are supposed to build they teach you the process skills that you are supposed to build upon Okay, so look at that. Even if you're able to solve the question using an alternate method, spend the time in absorbing the approach that you see in the solution. Okay, that is the whole point of this session is to tell you how is it that you should be studying and what is important and what is not important. Okay, so good. I'm, I'm glad that you are getting the essence of the session now. All right, let's now move to the next section here. And this next section is... A bit of theory. When I say a bit of theory, it's uh, I'm showing you another application which is really relevant more to the remainder equation that we are talking about over here. But you'll see how how it is based on very solid principles. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's say you have what is the remainder when 31 plus 43 is divided by 7. Okay, now there are two ways of getting to the answer. One way is to simply sum the numbers up and then divide that by 7. The other is to first divide each of the numbers by, by 7, okay, and then add the two remainders, okay. Are all of you good with both the approaches? Do both of you, do all of you understand that you can actually add the remainders to find the remainder of the sum? Okay, good. Now, when we come to um, multiplication or product, okay, now in this case, when you, in this case, if you apply sequence 1, sequence 1 will lead to very lengthy calculations. Okay, you'll have to 31 times 43, you have to do that. Then you have to do this, this over here. Versus, if you simply applied sequence 2, what you can do is you simply uh, divide these smaller numbers by 7 and then you simply multiply the two remainders. Not add, but multiply. Okay, so in this case, your method sequence 2 is something which is more efficient. Okay. 
Now again, as I said, this is more applicable to remainders, but if you think about how do we arrive at this, you will see how you know we are essentially visualizing the information here. Okay, so this is what we are doing. We are writing 31 in terms of the divisibility equation or the remainder equation, whichever one you want to call it. That's what we are doing with 43 as well. Now when you add these two, what do you get? You are adding the like terms together. You're putting the like terms together. Okay, so over here, what you see is I have grouped the like terms here. So what do I get? 7 into 4 plus 3, and I have grouped the other two terms separately. Okay, so what is it that you get? You're actually getting 3 plus 1 as the separate thing over here. And that is why you are able to add the two remainders because again, this one will go completely. This is part of your divisor into quotient form. Okay, same thing you're doing with multiplication as well. So after this session, what I want you to do is take a look at this slide and get to this on your own so that you understand how we are doing the manipulation. So essentially, this rationale of adding and multiplying remainders is nothing but manipulating your, your, divis your divisibility equation in the case of sum and product. Okay, so it's very, very straightforward. But I want you will not get it right away. Okay, I want you to spend some time on this and do it step by step on your own so that you understand how is it that we are doing this. Okay, but for the sake of this session, just so we can continue on, uh, what I want you to keep in mind right now is and make a note on your scratch pad that um, how is it that, that when you have to find remainder of sum, you can actually simply find the remainder of the individual terms. Likewise, remainder of product, you can simply figure out the, uh, the product of the remainders of the individual terms. Okay? All right, so now let's, uh, let's apply this on this particular question. Go ahead. All right, so let's broadcast the results here. Let me ask you one question. The correct answer here is choice A. Zero is the answer. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you did any sort of calculation in this question? Okay, what was the approach that you used for this question? Write down your approach here. Okay, good. So, how many of you actually applied, observed that 24 is in the product and 24 is divisible by 3 so the answer here is zero. How many of you solve the question in that manner? Good, good, all right. Okay, and again, this was, uh, so there are some of you who did not, and I could tell by your qualitative responses here, wherein you are talking about, you know, um, sequence two, and then um, 
cyclicity prime factor try to visualize so again so i could tell from that but again you know when you're looking at gmat questions just keep this thing in mind questions are not difficult okay gmat doesn't throw anything at you that you cannot handle okay so now when you take a look at this question some of you who are just starting off may get a little bit bogged down by the shear by the exponents in the question and you may think oh my goodness am i supposed to do this division okay but remember gmat is not a test of calculation okay what it is a test of is can you apply basic principles here and over here and that's where you need to spend the right amount of time observing information okay of observing the information that's given to you and that's very important for you to apply the process skill of visualization okay now in this case you observe the numbers 24 38 24 is already divisible by 3 you observe that there is a product sign there okay now obviously things would be different if this were a plus sign right in that case all you would have figured out is that this term is going to contribute a remainder zero so i need to focus only on this term over here right but in this case because the product itself because this is a product you know that okay this is a uh, you know that uh, you know that, that the remainder is going to be zero so again make observations before you jump to solve before you jump to making any calculations okay now let's apply the same principle on question number 5 well you can't apply the same principle because here the number has changed so let's solve this question now all right the correct answer here is 2 that is c again straightforward question essentially what you have to do is get the remainder of uh, each of these terms 25 remainder 3 is 1 38 remainder 3 is 2 multiply the 2 you get 2 uh, raised to the power 3 so you get 8 but again 8 cannot be the remainder so you have to um you have to again multiply divide divide 8 by 3 again and you get the remainder as 2 how many of you solve the question use utilizing the approach that i have just shown good any doubts about the solution okay good now let's look at what is coming next yes about the other one yes because the answer was already zero because uh, 24 divided by 3 was zero Now twenty twenty four is completely divisible by three. All right. Now in the next section, what we're going to do is so over here again. All we did was we 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 manipulated this stuff so that we our calculations can be simplified. And again, this is simply applying core principles. Okay, and this is a process skill of simplification. Okay. Now let's talk about yet another simplification. Uh, which is very very specific only to remainder equation okay and this is called as negative remainders and i want you to just pay a little bit of attention here and again a disclaimer all all the stuff that we're going to do in um, in on this slide is really applicable only to remainder questions okay this is the only part which is just specific to remainder questions now um let's say you have a number 5 you're dividing that by 2 so remainder is 1 
Now there is yet another way to ex likewise there is a number 8 you divide that by 3 you get the remainder as 2. Right now this is your classic sense of the classic remainders. Now what if you expressed 5 as 2 times 3 minus 1. You can write 5 in terms of uh, 6 minus 1 as well. Right. Likewise you can write 8 as 3 times 3 minus 1. So look what I'm doing here. Here I had plus 1. Here I have minus 1. Why? Because I've changed my, my quotient. Quotient was 2 here. In this case quotient is 3. Likewise over here I've changed the quotient. Quotient was 2 here and here the quotient is 3. Okay. And my remainder is now minus 1. Here the remainder was 2. Okay, now why is it that I'm working? So is so there's nothing wrong with this, right? I mean, I'm just this is also this this equation also leads to eight, and this one also leads to eight, right? So again, there's nothing wrong in it. But why do I need to get these negative remainders? Again, remember our goal over here is to simplify our calculations, right? So sometimes for ease of processing, we can consider negative remainders. Okay, but again, we always have to apply constraints. If you get to an equation such that you get a minus 1 as a, as a negative remainder, you always have to convert that back into positive remainder. And how you do that is, I'm not going to go into the details of it right now, but you will have this slide with you. So I want you to do this processing on your own. But ultimately, what you're going to get is if you simply add back the divisor, to the negative remainder, so essentially negative remainder plus your divisor will give you back the positive remainder. Okay. For now, just just memorize that right now. But when you go back, when I share this uh, presentation with you, please go through this entire derivation here so that you understand what we are talking about. And again, this is another application of your visualization. Okay. You will you will get better at visualization as you see these kinds of manipulations. Okay. All right. Now let's apply that on this question. Okay. You will see why we need to, why having negative remainders works. Right. So try, try applying that over here. Go ahead. Solve the question. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. So almost everyone got the answer here. Let me just go through the solution here. So you have you have this product term and this this another term, and you're taking sum of this, and you need to figure out what is the remainder when this entire term is divided by three. So essentially, the problems is very simple here because this entire thing will lead will give a remainder of zero so all you're concerned about is 17 uh, remain remain 17 raised to the power 7 remainder 3 that's what you need to figure out now in this case if you simply apply the negative remainder that is if we express 17 as 3 times 6 which is 18 minus 1 right what you will get is now um, minus 1 raised to the power 7 and you get that minus 1 now you need to convert that to a positive remainder you do minus 1 plus 3 3 is your divisor remember 3 is your divisor and you get 2 as the remainder now versus if you had if you didn't know this concept of negative remainders you would have gone the regular route 
and you would have had to then 2 raised to the power 7 you had to get you would have had to do that calculation and then again divide that by 3 further to get to your remainder okay but again with negative remainders especially you know you you should use negative again the whole point of using negative remainders is that you can get your your goal is to get to a smaller number there and minus 1 is the ideal numbers number right minus 1 is a lot more ideal why because all you have to do is raise it to the power and and, and it still remains the same it's either minus 1 or 1 depending upon your power okay any questions about this? Okay, let's take a look at our next number. So I do see a comment here, but it seems easier with positive remainders. How how would it be easier? If you if, if you would have had to do two raised to the power seven, that's a lot more intensive calculation. Okay, the correct answer here is choice D. Okay. If you add negative remainder to the, to the divisor, what of the quotient will it reduce? No, the quotient always remains the same. And again, you are asking this question because you are not you are not really hundred percent clear about what it is that we are doing. And and it's okay. There's a lot of new stuff in this. Okay. So I want you to take a look at this PDF after the session and absorb it. Go through each and every slide and understand what it is that, that we are doing. Because again, your question is that what about the quotient? The quotient remains the same. The quotient is not changing. Okay. All right, now let's solve this question here. Okay, so everyone got the correct answer. Choice E is the correct answer. But let me ask this. How many of you were able to do the negative remainder application? Okay, a number of you were. Okay, so again, let, let's do this. 17 divided by 6 and 17 raised to the power 7. So if we go the negative remainder route, we simply do 16 times 3 minus 1. If we go the positive remainder out, it's 16 times 2 plus 5. Again, plus 5 is a lot more, comp 5 as a remainder is a lot more complicated than minus 1. But again, minus 1, I have to, re I have to change that to 5 and I get the answer over here. Okay. The correct answer is choice E. Okay, again, if you if you were to do it with the positive remainder 5, then what you would need to do is, you can't just end here. Remember, you have a raised to the power 7, so you would then have to calculate 5 divide 5 raised to the power 7, then you would get the value of that, and then you would divide that by 
by 6 to get to the answer. Okay. Okay. Alright, so now let's move on to our next question here. So again, over here what we are talking about is that negative remainders can really simplify calculations. Okay, and it's okay to process negative remainders, but again, always need to think about converting the negative remainder back into a positive remainder. Okay. Now let's come back to our question here. And again, whoever have any, whoever has any questions uh, uh, regarding the negative remainder method, please put it in the um, in the Q and A pod here. Okay. So again, for those of you who are asking why can't we do the positive remainder, again, it's because you have to do all that processing. Okay. So I'm not sure if you are not applying the negative remainder. Uh, concept how is it that you are solving the question okay all right let's now come back to question number eight our original question here so let's try to solve this again and then I'm going to discuss the solution. All right, I see that quite a few of you have already solved this question. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll now. So I can already see a stark improvement in the performance of this question, in your performance. So the first time when you answered this question, only about 36% of the class selected the correct answer. But now that number has increased. Now again, um, choice C was the more popular choice, which right now is not the case. Right now, only 21% of the class selected choice C as the correct answer. Okay, So let's go into what changed and how is it that you should have approached the question. Okay, So something has, something has improved. So tell me, for those of you who did change their answers, who did get to the correct answer, how is it that you were able to get to it? Before I go into the details. So what changed? For those of you whose approach changed between now and last time when you solved the question, what changed? Followed your approach, visualization, absolutely. Absolutely. And that is the beauty of following the right kind of approach. 
Okay, again, remember these are, this is a very GMAT like question. And when you guys didn't have the right approach, you made a mistake in solving this question. But now, this question has become so much easier. Okay, so good. I'm really glad to hear that. Okay, so let's solve this question in a step by step manner here. So first of all, in a DS question, we always have to do question statement analysis. So here, what is it that we need to find out? P, when, uh, what is the remainder when P is divided by M and M is greater than 1? Now, what, what does statement 1 say? Statement 1 tells me that P is equal to M plus 1 raised to the power 8. Okay, so I have been given what P, uh, the relationship between P and M. Now, when I'm dividing P by M, what am I literally doing? I'm literally doing m plus 1 raised to the power 8 divided by m, right? Which means it's nothing but m plus 1 divided by 8 and then I uh, divide by m and then I'm taking the power outside. Now, m divided by m will also, again, m plus 1 divided by m will always leave a remainder 1, okay? So, really, it's 1 raised to the power 8, which is 1, okay? So, even if I don't know the values of p and m, Given this relationship here and given what it is that I have to do, I simply have to do find out the remainder when P is divided by M, I can do the processing and I can get to the remainder. So choice A is sufficient, which means that my answer could be any of these. My answer could be either A or D, right? Now, I take a look at statement 2. Statement 2 simply tells me that M is equal to 8. Now, I have no information about what P is. So, I cannot really solve this question. So, the correct answer here is choice A. Now, for those of you who, um, again, when first time when you answered this question, the accuracy was only 37% for this question. Okay, But, choice C was selected by 39% of class. So, to show choice C, was more popular than choice A. Why? Because it's because you were simply on the surface at that time. You simply saw that okay, so statement one is giving me a relationship between P and M. Okay, and statement two is giving me value of M. So if I combine these two together, I will be able to find out what the remainder is. Okay, and that is a very, very uh, shallow approach. Okay, you are not going deep into the question. You're not doing any visualization. You're not doing any simplification. In this case, what we are doing is we are doing simplification. So all the stuff that I talked to you about with regards to adding remainders and multiplying remainders, all that approach is actually applicable here. Okay? you are actually applying those skills over here, those simplification skills. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Now let's move on to our next question here. And here are your choices once again. All right, then. Last five seconds. Okay. 
I'm going to end the poll now. So the, the, the performance has improved. Okay, let me just get your previous responses here. The correct answer here is choice A. And last time around, um, you know, there wasn't any clear, there was no clear winner. And again, the confidence level for this question was really low. Okay, uh, but this time around, more people are leaning towards choice A. So let me ask, and again, as I said, my, uh, I didn't expect that all of you will be able to get to the correct answer. But again, things are moving in the right direction. You're getting stuff, okay? So let me ask you this question. How many of you who selected choice A are now confident about your response? Or what changed? Okay, tell me about what has changed from uh, the first time answering the question to now after the session, after going through the session, the negative remainder, absolutely, visualization. Very good. Okay, so let's go through this. Um, thought of even odd value of n, absolutely, good. So the question statement analysis, what is it that we need to find out? 38, we need to find out the remainder when 38n squared is divided by 13. Okay, now this is a really complicated, little intimidating expression, right? So again, Whenever, so how many of you found this question statement itself a little intimidating with the with the exponents and then the remainder? Yes, absolutely. The question statement is intimidating. Okay, and that's when you have to when you see a, an intimidating question statement. That's when you have to ask, tell yourself, I know everything that I need to know in order to solve this question. And at the same time, I trust the test maker. He's not going to give anything to me that I cannot handle. Okay, so you need to have that trust in both you and the test maker. Okay, now in this case, you see how, how that trust plays out. 38 divided by 13, right? Now, you can apply the concept of negative remainders here. Okay, because if you were to utilize just the positive remainders, you will get the positive remainder as 12, and then you don't know the power of it, and it's going to be a big nightmare. Okay, but you have your negative remainder, and again, think about it. The author will not have, will not have the uh, the the test maker is not going to give you a question such that you know you have you don't get negative one remainder. Okay, he is going to give you a question such that you do get a negative one remainder, and that's what is happening over here. Now the remainder is minus one. Now minus one raised to the power n squared. With minus one, you have two different scenarios here. One in which n is odd and the other in which n is even, right? When n is odd, your remainder will be minus 1, but then you'll have to process it further. You'll get to 12 as the remainder. When n is even, your remainder will be plus 1. No processing needed further. So really, to answer the question, what is the remainder, what you really have to figure out is whether the value n is odd or even. That is the simplification that you need to get to. Now, look at this part about, um, let's forget about the remainder part here, but just look at the extent of analysis that we did on the question statement itself. That is the key to solving data sufficiency questions. You need to extract as much juice as you can from the question statement. You need to arrive at the simplified question statement before you even start taking a look at the st individual statements, okay? And when you do start taking a look at the individual statements, you take a look at them, keeping in mind the simplified question that you need to answer, okay? Which in this case is, is an odd or even? So, by doing all of this processing, our divisibility question or remainder question has now converted into a simple even odd problem. Okay, now we, when we get to our negative, when, when we get to our statements, we'll see if this is, if, if there's some other concept to be applied. Now here, what is given to us? N leaves no remainder when divided by 4. Now what does that tell me? That simply tells me that N is an even number. So I know my answer. So, so choice A is, choice A or D could be the possible answers. Now take a look at statement 2. Square root of n is only divisible by 1 and itself, which means that square root of n is a prime number, which means that 
n is square of a prime number now what is square of a prime number square of a prime number can be 2 square 3 square 5 square and so on but again you have either even or odd okay you you still don't know whether n is even or odd which means statement 2 is not sufficient which means the correct answer is choice a now tell me having gone through the solution knowing about the negative remainders knowing about the approach to solving okay so these are the things that you know about you know the negative remainders you know the approach to solving questions is this question difficult the question in which you there was 25 percent accuracy okay is this question difficult I do see that there are some people who still think that this question is difficult but the majority doesn't think so again and it's okay so but how, what is it that you needed to do to make this difficult question easy the remainder is 12 well, no, 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 the, the remainder is 1. Again, but that's not the point here. Visualization, the correct approach, absolutely. Step-by-step -step process and applying the concepts, absolutely. Okay, now what we're going to do is, the last question I, I don't want to solve right now. Okay, why? Because I want you guys to, res I, I will share the PDF with you. And I want you guys to revise the entire presentation. Okay, because I want you guys to have a very, very good idea about the concepts. Because right now, this think about, think about this as simply the introduction to, to different concepts here, to, to the concepts and the process here. I want you guys to absorb all of that and then take a look, solve question number 10 on your own. Okay. The entire solution is 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 over here. It's a detailed solution, right? And if you solve this question on your own, you will be able to figure out. If you revise the whole thing first and then come to the solution, you will feel a lot more confident about this question here. Okay. All right. So with this, we've come to the end of this session. One thing that I do want to tell you all is, which you would have realized by now. GMAT quant can be very well mastered. Okay, you can go from a very low score to a very high score if you focus on learning in the right manner. Okay, and what I want to do right now is share with you certain stories of students who come from different uh, different ranges of starting quant score and who were able to get to their target quant score by utilizing the course by doing the course in the right manner. Okay. So there's something for everyone in these stories. The first success story is for people who think that they are really good in quant. Okay, and you should read his verified review here on GMAT Club. Now Krish had always done very well in quant, but he was stumped by GMAT. He constantly faltered while answering GMAT questions, falling in familiar traps, and frustrated with the lack of progress, he he decided to change his entire approach. He started following a methodical approach and even changing his approach significantly for data sufficiency questions. Okay, After making these changes, he was able to improve his quant score to Q51, that's the highest possible, and he ended up with a 740. Okay. Now this next story is a very South American person. He utilized the custom quizzing feature like anything. Okay, Leonardo, someone who had not been excellent with GMAT quant, and he was stuck with Q45, he, despite trying really hard. He needed a high quant score because he wanted to apply to finance-focused schools such as NYU, Wharton, as well as Tupper. To improve beyond Q45, Leo adopted a methodical approach. He started consciously focusing on constraints, showing his work on paper. Once he had the approach right, he made extensive use of analytics that Quant Scholarium provides to isolate the areas that he needed to improve upon. Then he used the custom quizzing feature to ensure that he had actually improved.
Because of his good quant score and excellent verbal score, Leo was admitted to Wharton, Stern and Tepper. Now this third success story is of an individual who was extremely weak in quant. His starting score was Q30, a mere 20 percentile. Mazibar, and that's his BTG, BTG Mat forum name, spent a ton of time reading quant books, but he was not able to improve. He benefited from the progressive learning architecture at EG Mat, in which he was able to cement his basics before taking on difficult questions. And in his case, because his basics and, and the cases in which his basics were not strong, he was given appropriate feedback. Because of the quizzes that are built into each file, he was able to leverage data to help him. He was able to improve to Q45, which is 59 percentile in quant, and this was a huge improvement over his starting score. Now, Guru Lermo's story is again another amazing story of an individual who had an extremely strong determination to study at top B schools. Again, having that end goal in sight really makes you, makes you get to that end goal in a very, very methodical manner. He started at Q38, which coincidentally is 38 percentile on GMAT quant. He realized that he needed a stellar quant score to get an admit from Wharton and GSB Chicago. And the only way to improve from such a low score was to truly focus on learning, which he did using the video lessons. And he was short on time, so he used analytics in quant scholarium to isolate the areas where he needed most help. Like Leonardo, he used the custom quiz feature to ensure that he indeed improved on these topics. So again, to ace GMAT quant, focus on learning and adopting good habits. Focus on making sure that you have that 200% clarity in concepts, okay? And make sure that you learn all the process skills that, that you need to learn. And there are five of them which you need to learn, okay? So again, 200% clarity, step-by-step -step manner. Again, read the question statement properly. Trust the test maker, as I said, okay? And believe in your skills. You have everything that you need in order to solve the questions, okay? So as next steps, again, um, I would say take a look at for, for each math students, start going through the number properties course, okay? And for, for people who have still not purchased the EGMAT course, you have the free trial, you have the PDF that I'm going to share with you in a bit, and then you have all these questions um, in Scholaranium. Now, I do offer some more practice questions in this PDF, but before you get to those practice questions, I do want you to go through the entire presentation once more and get that clarity, understand, understand the process skills, understand the the simplification skills that we talked about over here, and then definitely solve the last three questions in the um, in the presentation here. Okay. All right then, so with this, we've come to the end of the second part of the webinar, and I am going to invite Rajat back into the session here. Okay, and he will take your questions. Um, all right, now, I do want you to capture I do want to give I do want you to give me your feedback on the session as well as what is it that you have learned um, and while I just bring back the poll here let me also I will also then get the PDF All right, and I'm going to remove all the questions from this uh, Q&A part so that you can enter your new questions here. Okay. All right. All right, guys, uh, good luck. And Rajat is in the session now, so he will be taking your questions at the end.
All right, guys, now we are in the third part of the webinar. Let me share the PDF with you. Ah, the PDF's already there, so that's wonderful. Okay, uh, with that, if you have any questions, uh, uh, I'd be happy to, uh, uh, to take those uh, and address those. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, then uh, I'd recommend that you go through the free trial. I'd also recommend that you uh, register for the webinar next week, which is uh, the Reading Comprehension webinar. So you can click on register now. It's not on July 27th. It is uh, on August 24th. Let me just make sure that I have the, the right part in there. Ah, that's my bad. I had the wrong part in there. This is the right part. Yes. And thank you for providing your ratings. I can barely see that upwards of 61%. Uh, have given this session a perfect, and that's wonderful to know. There's a question in which I see in the comments is that GMAT Online help with AW and IR as well. For IR, we have the world's most comprehensive course that's included in GMAT Online. For AWA, frankly, we haven't had a lot of people asking us for this after they go through our critical reasoning course. But yes, if you need help, we'll, we can send you some templates. But honestly, once you go through the CR course, you'd find it very easy to uh, to go through AWA. In fact, some of our students have written templates for AWA. Okay, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. And, uh, and good luck for your, your journey. For your GMAT journey, uh, make sure you go through the free trial. Make sure you go through that found, through those foundation concepts too, uh, and, and and the practice questions in the free trial to cement the learning from today. With that, I'd like to see you guys on eGMAT.com uh, over the next few days. Thank you and bye bye.